Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. If you'd like to become a patron of the podcast, we would love you to. And you can do so at patreon.com forward slash the History Network. Thanks to all our patrons who make this podcast possible. The HistoryNetwork.org podcast, season 35, episode 3, The Luck of Li Guang, a cavalryman's charge through the Hon Chongnu War. This episode was written by Scott Forbes Crawford, an author based in Asia. He writes about ancient and medieval history in novels and non-fiction alike. A newly published history book, The Han Xiongnu War, 133 BC to 89 AD, explores a decisive conflict between China and a nomadic steppe empire through the lives of 15 historical figures, including the subject of today's episode. On that day in 144 BC, Colonel Li Guang was in command at the frontier outpost when one of his officers dashed in to give a breathless report. While on patrol of a band of cavalry, the Chinese officer had sighted three of the enemy nomadic Xiongnu horsemen. Apparently they were out hunting. Thinking he had caught them unawares, the officer moved in with his unit only for the hunters to turn their bows on them. Keeping their distance, the Xiongnu picked off all but the officer who narrowly escaped with his life. Later known as the Flying General for his speed and snap decisions, Li Guang did not coolly assess the situation but chose to act. Galloping out at the head of one hundred men, soon Li found the three Xiongnu, slew two and captured the third, easy enough, until the thousands of enemy horsemen emerged from hiding. It had all been a trap. How did Li work his way out of it? His decision would mean the difference between living through the day and the massacre of his men, and his story, one rife with both heroics and folly, also shines a light on the larger conflict between China coming into its own as an empire and the Xiongnu Empire, a nomadic superpower of the ancient world which once terrorised China but later fought for its life. For millennia, China had been not a single nation, but rather a patchwork of warring kingdoms. At last, the state of Qin defeated or cowed all its rivals in 221 BC. Through tyrannical rule and a sweeping bureaucracy, the Qin melded the far-flung and culturally distinct states into a single empire. Next came expansion into new territory. In 215 BC, the Qin invaded an area north of China's Yellow River, known as the Ordos Plateau, a well-watered grassland. The Ordos offered prime conditions for raising the horse stocks China so desperately desired. Yet China's claim to the land would be contested by its current occupants, the people of the Xiongnu Empire. Likely formed in the 4th or 3rd century BC, the Xiongnu were a confederation of diverse nations and tribes. The empire occupied what is now Mongolia, as well as parts of eastern Central Asia. A multi-ethnic, multilingual society, their common traditions as nomads of the Eurasian steppe bound them, including their exquisite skills as mounted archers and their worship of Tengri, the sky spirit who promised that enemies slain in battle would become a warrior's slaves in the afterlife. Yet perhaps the strongest glue to unite the disparate groups together and forge a common cause was the threat they collectively faced, China. The extent of Xiongnu resistance marshalled against the 215 BC Qin invasion remains unknown, but not the outcome, expulsion. 
For years, the nomads eked out an existence in the windswept plains of the northeast. A boon came to them, though, in the form of Chinese political instability. When the Qin Emperor died unexpectedly in 210 BC, his regime soon tottered, giving way to civil war in China. The Xion Nu exploited the vacuum and reoccupied their stolen lands. The challengers for the Chinese throne winnowed down to two states, Chu and Hon. After years of fighting and intrigues, the Hon prevailed, establishing itself in 202 BC. The fledgling empire had little capacity or appetite to pursue hostilities with the Xiongnu. Yet, the nomadic neighbours had long been involved in Chinese commerce and politics, and some Chinese kingdoms allied with them. In short order, the Hon found itself sucked into an encounter at the Battle of White Peak, a unit of the Hon army, commanded by the emperor himself, was lured away from its main body and surrounded. Rather than annihilate their foes, the nomads opted for a more prosperous solution. In return for sparing the army and the emperor, they would take payments of Chinese silk, liquor, currency and also Chinese princesses. These women played such a key part in the arrangement it was known as the marriage alliance. This policy would maintain a facade of peace between the two powers for decades, though only really forestalled the inevitable clash. Having bought stability at great cost, including to its imperial prestige, the Hon could focus on strengthening itself. Without a war to bleed the treasury and pull farmers from their fields, commerce boomed. The fat tax base enabled the purchase of weapons, including the powerful crossbows, which shot for shot could outshine the famed compound bows of the nomads. Horses recognised as critical to engaging a mobile foe, like the Xiongnu, yet always in short supply, were bought and bred. In this sense, the marriage alliance served long-term Chinese interests. On the whole, though, the policy failed, for the Xiongnu frequently mounted raids and incursions, despite the alleged peace between the states. Chinese text sources do not reveal Hon provocations or treaty violations, but the nomads' transgressions owed at least partly to the decentralised nature of their political system. In stark contrast to the autocratic Hon regime, the Chanyu or Xionyu emperor might agree a treaty with the Hon in all sincerity, yet he could not bind every member of the confederacy to his word. The situation continued to sour until an attack in 166 BC woke up the Chinese to their precarious state, no longer content to gnaw at the borderlands the Xiongnu launched a massive incursion into the heart of the Chinese realm, riding in sight of the imperial capital and burning some palaces in its suburbs. It appears this is where Li Guang first saw action serving in the defence as a mounted archer. He learned these skills as a skion of a famed warrior family and also as a boy growing up on China's northern border where the culture fostered horsemanship and archery. So great was his skill with the bow, it was said that once when out hunting tigers, Lee missed his shot, only to discover his arrow had pierced a rock. An author of the time described Lee as a tall man with long arms. His build made him a superb archer. He went on to add, I myself have seen Lee Guang, a man so plain and unassuming that you would take him for a peasant and almost incapable of speaking a word. Li thrived on action and daring, prompting a government official to observe, Li Guang has no equal in the empire, 
Having the measure of his own talents, he throws himself into battle against the enemy again and again. I fear he shall soon die. Thus, Lee had the talents, experience, and devil-may-care attitude to call upon when finding himself lured in 144 BC by the three Xiongnu hunters into a trap. Against such impossible odds outnumbered by a factor of ten or more, his men urged the obvious choice to call for a quick retreat to the protection of their army. He disagreed, favouring the bolder course, explaining... Since our army lies ten or fifteen miles away, if we attempt to race back, the Xiongnu will be at our heels, shooting at us all the while. Better to remain here, and make them believe we are meant to lure them into an attack by our army. In fact, Li soon took it a step further, ordering his troops to ride closer to the enemy. What else might Xiongnu believe, other than the trap was about to spring? No sane commander would advance when he had less than one-tenth the men of his opposition. Still, Lee gambled, now telling his men to dismount and remove their horses' saddles as if settling in for a few hours of leisure. When a flummoxed Xiongnu officer riding a white horse strayed close to investigate, Li Guang shot him dead. This brazen act seems to convince the horsemen of an imminent attack, and they beat a quick retreat, a thousand or more fleeing one hundred Chinese soldiers. Quick wits, bold action, and perhaps most of all, luck came through for Li this time, but in time he would learn his luck could turn. Despite the frequent incursions into their lands, China did not declare war, to those in the government who longed to give rein to their anger, one minister stated, Now, when China is not troubled by so much as the bark of a dog to become involved in wearisome projects in distant lands that exhaust the wealth of the nation, this is hardly right for a ruler whose duty is to be the father to the people, to seek to fulfil endless ambitions, determining to win revenge and incurring the hatred of the Xiongnu this will not bring peace to the frontier. And another warned, if we march thousands of miles away and try to fight with Xiongnu, our men and horses will be worn out, and then the wretches will muster all their strength and fall upon us, an arrow from the most powerful crossbow, when it has reached the end of its flight, will not pierce the sheerest gauze, the strongest wind, when its force is spent, will not lift a goose feather, not because both are not strong at the outset, but because their force in time is dispersed. For decades, such views kept China out of naked conflict. The coronation of a ruler who came to be known as the Martial Emperor, though set China on a different path. In 133 BC, he declared war, but how to win such a complicated conflict? On their swift horses, the Xiongnu could give or deny battle as they chose, fleeing to their fastnesses if battle did not favour them. And as the ministers had pointed out, the logical challenges of breaching enemy territory were mammoth. The emperor's council and generals devised a plan to draw the Xiongnu to them and land a decapitating blow upon their leadership. The site was Mei the city of horses, not far from the border. A local merchant claimed he had slain the governor and now wished to give the city over to the nomads. Several hundred thousand Hon troops lay in hiding, ready to pounce on the unsuspecting enemy. But when Xiongnu approached, they noticed that no farmers tended the fields. They were passing. Here was the flaw in the Chinese plan. Concern for collateral civilian deaths had tipped off the enemy. The Xiongnu quickly gathered intelligence by attacking a Chinese fort. Interrogation of a survivor revealed the secret battle plan. Before the concealed Hon troops could deploy, the Xiongnu withdrew to safety. The aftermath laid bare the perils of Chinese military command, Livid at this failure and the expense of calling up such a huge army, the Hon Emperor ordered the execution of the general who had orchestrated the attempted ambush. Amid such 
charged conditions, opportunity came for Li Guang, if only his luck might hold. Having failed at their decapitating ambush in which the Xiongnu had nearly delivered themselves, now the Hon must mount expeditionary campaigns into the harsh landscape. With no chance any more of catching the foe unprepared, Chinese would need battle-tested leaders. Promoted from colonel to general, Li Guang commanded a unit of 10,000 men and in 129 BC joined the first campaign. Three other generals with equal-sized forces also set out with him. A general named Wei Qing commanded one of the units. The two men grew into rivals, and in a decade their paths would collide disastrously. The army advanced as four separate columns. Li Guangs encountered a Xiongnu force outnumbering his own and fell into fierce combat. The enemy annihilated the Chinese troops, wounded Li and took him prisoner. To his captives he appeared unresponsive and they fashioned a stretcher of ropes suspended between two horses to carry him off. Just as Li had fooled the Xiongnu before in 144 BC, now his craftiness would serve him again. He was not nearly as severely injured as he made out, and he bided his time scanning for some kind of opening. It came when a horseman strayed close to him. Suddenly Li burst into life, stealing the horseman's steed and his bow, then galloping off, sending arrows winging back at his pursuers to keep them at bay. Li eventually rejoined the survivors of his unit, struggling back towards home. In the meantime, the general Wei Qing returned from his mission a hero, having won a stunning victory. The emperor duly honoured him. A different fate awaited Li. He was arrested for his disastrous performance in the field. After all, the general at the failed ambush in Mai was given a sentence of execution without even sacrificing any troops. Li had done far worse, losing most of his army. His life hung in the balance. Ultimately, the court spared him, though, he was heavily fined and had to bear the indignity of surrendering his hereditary title, becoming a commoner. In disgrace, Li retired his commission. The war raged on. In 126 BC, it saw the Xiongnu seizing the initiative with a three-pronged attack on Chinese lands. Soon after, Li was recalled to service. He ventured out on an expedition with Wei Qing, Again in 123 BC, a search and destroy mission, but luck snubbed him and he failed to uncover a single enemy. Not so the next expedition, occurring in 121 or 120 BC. Li took command of 4,000 cavalry, including his own. He was paired with a unit of 10,000 troops, led by Zhang Qiyen, a general explorer and diplomat. A giant of Chinese history, Zhang had played a critical role in the China's protection of power to the far west and its machinations to gain control of the Silk Road. The Xiongnu maintained a sphere of influence encompassing many of the wealthy city-states to the west, the Central Asia oases, which made up vital nodes of the Silk Road commerce. By levying taxis and soldiers they could address their resource in balance with the Chinese, who always enjoyed massive advantages in manpower and wealth. An important Hon strategy came to be known as cutting off the right arm of the Xiongnu, depriving the nomads from this critical base of support. Increasingly, the Hon Xiongnu War centred on controlling these western territories. Zhang Qian's travels earned him many honours, including his general rank, though his military inexperience would soon be revealed to Li Guang. Deep in Xiongnu's lands, Li's small unit split off from Zhang's larger force. Once again, Li found himself surrounded by an enemy massively outnumbering him. Ever the gambler, he ordered his son to strike at the enemy with twenty or thirty men. His son rode out and engaged the foe, declaring on his return, 
Collecting the ears of dead barbarians is easy work. This briefly bucked up the Chinese troops flagging spirits. Cover was lacking out in the open, so Lee ordered his men to form a ring from their supply wagons. With this improvised defensive feature, Lee settled in for a last stand. Even as the Xiongnu rode around the ring lobbing arrows, Lee told his men to conserve their ammunition, for now he sought something more dramatic. Taking out his trusty crossbow, nicknamed Big Yellow, he picked out enemy leaders and sent his bolts flying. Soon several were snatched from their saddles into the dirt, including the second in command. This stole the fight out of the Xiongnu today, but Li knew more, and worse was to come the next morning. It did. Of the survivors of the previous day's fighting, Li lost more than half his men. On and on the Xiongnu circled, deluging the dwindling survivors with arrows. No matter Li's ingenuity and daring, there was simply no way to overcome such overwhelming numbers. But then... At last, the resilience of Li's troops earned its reward. The general, Zhang Chien, and his 10,000 troops charged in, scattering the enemy and rescuing their beleaguered comrades. Li Guang won no honours for his performance in the field, though at least on his return to China this time he faced no punishment. His inability to gain the aristocratic rank of Marquis, though, did nettle him. Fortune tellers and oracles often provided guidance to people in ancient China, and Li turned to one in the depths of his professional despair. Li explained to him, Ever since the Hon started attacking Xiongnu, I have never failed to be in the fight. I have had my men in my command, who were company commanders or even lower, and who didn't even have the ability of average men, and yet twenty or thirty of them have won marquisates on the strength of their achievements, in attacking the barbarian armies. I have never been behind anyone else in doing my duty. Why is it I have never won one ounce of distinction, so that I could be enfeoffed like the others? To this the fortune teller replied that he should look to review his life for rash choices he had made. Lee shared that once when he was a governor in a distant province, he diffused a revolt of native people by promising their lives if they were to surrender. But then, added Lee, I went back on my word and killed them all the very same day. I have never ceased to regret what I did. Nothing brings greater misfortune than killing those who have already surrendered to you, declared the fortune teller. This is the reason, General, that you have never become a Marquis. Yet fate offered Lee one last chance to redeem himself, the war of late had tended toward stalemate. The ability of the Xiongnu to retreat and melt into the landscape meant that while the Hon could win battles, they could not easily consolidate victory. In fact, this became a key strategy of the Xiongnu, knowing how costly in lives and treasure it was for the Chinese to launch long-range expeditions. They also believed they were virtually untouchable in their homeland, shielded by the uncrossable Gobi Desert. Wei Qing, though his star still ascendant with the Emperor, proposed to traverse the Gobi and land a blow to the heart of the nomads' territory, teaching them that they were not out of Chinese reach. The Empire put out a call for horses, from those trained for war to those pulling ploughs, amassing them in great numbers. To survive the crossing, they were overfed, enabling the horses to shed their reserves and thus survive with limited fodder available in the desert. Lee planned to ride in the vanguard of the army and target the enemy leadership. What he did not know was that the emperor had pulled Wei Qing aside and told him, Lee is not to pursue the Xiongnu emperor. The Hon ruler did not care for the stink of ill luck about Lee nor was the general to be trusted with any other vital role in the campaign. Abruptly the plan changed. Now Li would lead a separate element and effect a junction in the desert, another of the complicated operations which had failed before. 
the Battle of the Northern Desert proved a turning point in the Hon Xiongnu War, the Chinese striking a devastating blow against their enemy. The General Wei Qing would go on to enjoy even greater plaudits. He became so celebrated, he even had the dubious honour of regular personal audience with the Emperor as he went about his business in the toilet. For Li Guang, however, luck still eluded him. Confused by the complex, featureless terrain, the general missed the junction with the rest of the army, and in turn the entire momentous battle. When he finally arrived at the Hon army camp, an angry Wei Cheng dispatched a clerk to harangue Li and demand an accounting of himself. This time for Li Guang, execution seemed inescapable. He gathered his officers to address them. Since I was old enough to wear my hair round up, he began, I have fought over seventy engagements, large and small, with the Xiong Yu. This time I was fortunate enough to join the General-in-Chief in a campaign, but he shifted me to another division and sent me riding round the long way. On top of that I became lost. Now I am over sixty, much too old to stand up to a bunch of petty clerks in their charges. Li's audacity, which had allowed him to trick the Xiong Yu when he was vastly outnumbered and to fight in the face of impossible odds, would come to him one final time. He drew his sword and took his own life before his government could. The men of the army and the common people wept without cease. Such was their admiration for the general. So wrote an author of the time. In the wake of Li Guang's death, the war carried on, the advantages of the Chinese in numbers and organisation making ever clearer the lopsided nature of the conflict. In time, the Hon grew into a bureaucratised war machine, the need shrinking for the likes of a bold but ultimately luckless warrior like Li Guang. Well, thank you, Scott, for writing that episode for us. It's lovely to have an episode from you once more. If you'd like to learn more about Li Guang, Zhang Cheyen, Wei Qing, as well as a woman who spied behind enemy lines, the Xiongnu leaders who denied the Chinese juggernaut and others, please read the Hon Xiongnu War 133 BC to 89 AD, the struggle of China and a steppy empire told through its key figures. It is available from Pen and Sword Books in the UK, Casemate Publishes in North America, and from Amazon and other major online booksellers. If you'd like to write an episode for us, or you have an idea for a subject you think we might not have covered yet, then drop us a line, info at thehistorynetwork.org. And once again, please do become a patron, patreon.com forward slash thehistorynetwork for that. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the History Network dot org podcast written by Scott Forbes Crawford, read by Nick Barker. Mm-hmm.